Let's pray as we come to God's word now. Heavenly Father, Revelation chapter 13 contains fearful images, but you have given them for our learning and encouragement. Please help us to listen well and to understand the things you have preserved here for us. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Last Friday, we celebrated the end of World War II in Europe with VE Day. We still celebrate 75 years later because war is such a horrible, horrible thing. And yet the Bible shows us that we who believe in Jesus are still involved in a horrible and violent war. It's a war that takes place in our homes, in our places of work and in our hearts. Do you remember how... Revelation chapter 12 ended. Let me remind us, it's on your screen now. Then the dragon, that is the devil, was enraged at the woman, that's God's people, and went off to make war against the rest of her offspring, those who obey God's commandments and hold to the testimony of Jesus. It's a picture of Satan or the devil making war against all who love and trust Jesus. Christians, the church. When you're at war, it's best to know as much as you can about your enemy. MI5 and MI6, our secret military intelligence services, are constantly gathering information about people and organisations whom they deem to be the enemies of the UK. Scientists are working around the clock to learn as much as they can about COVID-19 so that they can offer the best advice for avoiding it, but more than that, so that they can work out a way to defeat it and to produce a vaccine. Wonderfully, chapter 12 showed how Satan is already defeated. He was defeated at the cross where Jesus died to pay the penalty for sin so that people like us could be set free from the kingdom of Satan. Well, since then, people like you and me have been pouring out of his kingdom and pouring in to the kingdom of the Lord Jesus. Yes, Satan is defeated. But for a little while, he fights on. It's like D-Day and V-E Day. On D-Day, a decisive victory was won. But the end of the war in Europe didn't come until nearly 11 months later. The Nazis, though defeated, carried on fighting, doing their worst, until the Allies arrived and liberated every town and village across Europe. Well, that's what the devil, or Satan, does. He carries on doing his worst until Jesus arrives to finally and fully liberate his people, and indeed all creation. For the time being... God allows Satan to continue his attacks on the church because he is graciously and patiently giving time before the final trumpet shall sound for more men and women and children to be saved, to come out of Satan's wretched kingdom of darkness and slavery and death and into Jesus' kingdom of light and freedom and life. So this chapter of the Bible vividly shows us the power and influence of Satan as he prowls around and it encourages us to keep going with Jesus and to keep living for Jesus. In this war, Satan loves to use deception. He loves to deceive. So the big idea in chapter 13 is this. Don't be fooled by Satan's fake kings and kingdoms. Don't be fooled by Satan's fake kings and kingdoms. I wonder how good you'd be at spotting a fake. There's loads of fake stuff out there to buy, isn't there? Fake clothes, fake trainers, fake watches, fake perfume. I wonder, can you spot the real trainers here? And can you spot the real watch here? It's easy to be fooled, isn't it? But we know that Jesus is the real ruler of the world. Chapters 4 and 5 show him seated on the throne of heaven, ruling over all. 
But in Revelation 13, we see lots of fake rulers, fake rulers with Satan behind them, whom he uses to attack God's people. Have a look first with me at chapter 13, verses 1 and 2. It's on your screen. And I saw a beast coming out of the sea. He had ten horns and seven heads, with ten crowns on his horns. And on each head a blasphemous name. The beast I saw resembled a leopard, but had feet like those of a bear and a mouth like that of a lion. The dragon gave the beast his power and his throne and great authority. We know from chapter 12 that the dragon mentioned at the end there is Satan. But who or what does that leopard-like beast with seven heads and a mouth like a lion that emerged from the sea represent? It is clearly an agent of Satan because the dragon, Satan, gives it power and authority. But who or what is it? A horn is a symbol of power and strength. And this beast has ten horns, so it is very powerful. Seven is regarded as the perfect number and the beast has seven heads, which may be a claim to perfect wisdom. And it has ten crowns on its ten horns. So this is a beast that rules. And on each head is a blasphemous name. Blasphemy means lying about God or claiming to be God. You can see in verses 5 and 6 that it uttered lots of proud and blasphemous words. So this beast is a ruler or rulers who are very powerful and who, like leopards, bears and lions, are very aggressive. And they claim to be God with their blasphemous names. Now, obviously, if we saw something that looked like this ugly creature, we would run a million miles and not treat it as if it was God. But as we know, Revelation is using picture language. So who or what is this terrible beast depicting in real life? Who is this agent of Satan? Well, in the first place, for John's first readers, it is the Roman Empire and the Roman emperors who ruled in the time of this vision. Many of them claimed to be gods and demanded worship and they cruelly slaughtered those who refused, including many, many Christians. But we must understand that the beast represents more than just the Roman Empire. Remember, it resembled a leopard, but had feet like a bear and a mouth like a lion. Now, back in the Old Testament book of Daniel, Daniel had a vision of four beasts, which looked like a lion, a bear, a leopard, and then another particularly strange beast with ten horns and large iron teeth. In Daniel, we're told that these beasts all represented successive kingdoms or empires, which would all do wicked things to God's people. There's the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Medes and Persians, and the Greeks. So, this beast from the sea in Revelation 13, with its seven heads and ten horns with ten crowns, and blasphemous names, represents all human kingdoms and empires and leaders who set themselves up in the place of God. After the Roman Empire, which persecuted God's people back in John's time, there have been many others. I mean, just in living memory, we have had the evil Third Reich, the German Empire, the tyrannical Soviet Union and the brutal Islamic Caliphate, to name just a few. Some might add to that the British Empire. And what about the European Union that assumes power and pushes its liberal and anti-Christian ideologies on its subjects? What about the United Kingdom, which, amongst other things, has redefined marriage and aborts about 200,000 babies every single year? Not all power is bad and not all empires are evil. But as you can see in these verses, the empires here blaspheme God. They are taking the place of God. 
Maybe they redefine morality, which inevitably brings conflict with God's people. And they effectively, verse 8, command worship. Although the Roman Empire was in view for John, these verses speak of all human empires and kingdoms which basically abuse their power and assume for themselves rights that only belong to God. So this beast or monster is the state, the state that thinks it can play God and persecutes or kills those who worship the true and living God. And remember who is behind all this. It's the end of verse 2. The dragon, that Satan, gave the beast his power and his throne and his great authority. And look at verse 4. Men worshipped the dragon because he had given authority to the beast. So as people unthinkingly go along with whatever the state or culture says or does, they are effectively worshipping Satan. And look at what he gave the beast, that is, human empires and kingdoms, the uh, power and the authority to do. It's in verse 7. He, the beast, was given power to make war against the saints and to conquer them. Satan is behind all attacks on God's people. That's who the saints are, all God's people. He uses human states and empires and unions as his agent to, agents to do war against God's people. And so, verse 9, the same words that Jesus used when teaching in parables, He who has an ear, let him hear. He who has an ear, let him hear. It's easy to see how this applies to other parts of the world where wicked regimes in places like North Korea and China and Indonesia and Pakistan and parts of Africa operate. But before we think that this is just in other parts of the world, we should acknowledge that the West has become and is becoming increasingly hostile to God's people. Its tolerance liberal ideology is being forced on everyone in an intolerant, illiberal way. We have seen and are seeing morality redefined in areas such as marriage, euthanasia, gender, sexuality and abortion. And debate, debate around these things is largely being closed down. You see, the state is playing God. Christian medical staff and civil registrars have been persecuted because of their unwillingness to be part of things that God's word says are wrong. Western nations, including the UK, claim to be tolerant, but are increasingly intolerant of people who, in the words of Revelation 12, verse 17, want to obey the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. We must see from Revelation 13 that Satan is behind all this. So we need to be careful about what we happily go along with and what we allow our children to be taught. We need to ask, is the state trying to replace God or relegate God? The state is not all wise. The state does not have the right to change what is moral and right. Its job is to uphold true morality. The state is not God. There are lots of ways that human empires or states try to replace God. And these verses show us ways in which we can perhaps start to think of the state as God. First, a fake answer to death. A fake answer to death. So verse 3 says... One of the heads of the beast seemed to have a fatal wound, but the fatal wound had been healed. It's as if it is mimicking the lamb, Jesus, who was slain but who rose from the dead. Fatal wounds, by definition, don't heal. They are fatal. It's a mock resurrection because the beast 
is a mock Christ, a fake king. It's as if the beast is saying to the world, put your trust in me because I have beaten death. So I can beat death for you too. I can give you life. Well now we may be believing this lie if we think that the welfare state or the NHS can keep us all alive forever. The NHS is a truly wonderful thing, but people still die. Only Jesus has the words of eternal, di uh, eternal life. Only Jesus has truly beaten death. So don't put your trust in the state to give you life. Next, fake security. In verse 4, the beast is worshipped, and as it is worshipped, people ask, Who is like the beast? Who can make war against him? In the, in the Bible, that language, who is like him, is most commonly used of God. A phrase used to emphasise God's uniqueness. Who is like him? But here, people ask, who is like the beast? They are imagining the state to be supreme to be God. And when they ask who can make war against him, the implication is that no one can. The state is supreme. It provides ultimate security. But we know it doesn't. Our security is not supremely in the intelligence services or the armed forces or NATO. Ultimate security is found in Jesus. He is the Christ, God's eternal King. He is seated on the throne of heaven, ruling over all. There is no one like him. He is uniquely above all. So he is the one who offers ultimate security. So don't put your trust in the state for security, for the security that only Jesus can provide. Well, then there's fake unity fake unity. In verses 7 and 8 we're told, from the end of verse 7, and he was given authority over every tribe, people, language and nation. All the inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast. But hang on a moment, that's King Jesus' place. He's the one who has been given all authority in heaven and on earth. People think that unity can come through human channels and human empires. Spread the empire and bring everyone together under one ruler. That's what all the great empires have tried to do. That is what is behind the European Union project. And of course, unity is a good aim. But as we see time and time again, and most recently in Europe, human unity projects fail. They fail because of sin. It is only the gospel of Jesus Christ that brings people from every tribe and tongue and nation together in true unity, which will one day be fully realised, as we shall see when we get to the end of Revelation. Next we see fake religion. Fake religion. From verse 11, there's another beast. This one is coming out of the earth. And this beast is particularly chilling. It reminds me of that chill that goes down your spine when a character in a TV drama who you think is good suddenly reveals their true colours and they are actually the murderer. It's a chilling moment and that is what it's like here. The beast looks like a lamb. It's masquerading as Jesus. But he spoke like a dragon. It has the voice of Satan. And this beast, verse 14, because of the signs he was given power to do on behalf of the first beast, he deceived the inhabitants of the earth. He ordered them to set up an image in honour of the beast who was wounded by the sword and yet lived. This beast deceives the whole, whole world and leads the nations in mass idolatry. He does impressive, captivating signs. But see today from Revelation 13 that the devil and his agents 
are able to do very impressive things to deceive people and to stop them from putting their faith in Jesus. Lots of people in our community have been deceived by incredible experiences done through the power of the occult. Lots of people have seen dead relatives or heard them. Lots of people have had incredible experiences at the spiritualist church, which deceives people by even using the word church. Roman Catholicism deceives people into thinking that they can be right with God through their own good works and with the help of Mary or a priest or so-called saints, while denying the biblical truth of being made right with God by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Salvation is a gift of God. It's not something we can earn. <clears throat> the Church of England could also be in the frame here. Verse 12 says that the second beast made the earth worship the first beast. So the second beast made the earth worship and fall in line with the state. Well, it seems like that is what is happening as the Church of England gradually adopts the morality and values of the secular state and culture and promotes that morality and those values to people of faith instead of encouraging them to be distinctive. The Church of England has in many places become an agent not of God but of the state. Finally, there's a fake seal. Do you remember from chapter 7 that God's people were depicted having a seal put on their foreheads, marking them out as God's people so that they would be kept safe when God judges the world? We are sealed by the Holy Spirit. He is the seal we receive when we come to believe in Jesus. But at the end of chapter 13, the second beast is forcing everyone on earth to receive a mark on his right hand or his forehead so that no one could buy or sell unless they had the mark. It's mimicking God's sealing of his people. And this seal appears to promise prosperity. Because without it, people can't trade. Now, of course, as, as we've said many times before, Revelation deals in symbols. There is no actual mark put on the head or hand. It's a symbol taken from the world of slavery, where slaves were branded, either on their heads or on their hands. And the mark of the beast is that infamous number 666. Let me say that there is a lot of nonsense, utter nonsense about this number online. It's got nothing to do with tattoos or barcodes or microchips or oven chips or any other kind of chips. Verse 18 tells us that it is the number of the beast and man's number two. Remember, the numbers in Revelation are symbolic. The number seven is God's number. It symbolises perfection and fullness and completion. In creation, God rested on the seventh day. Everything was complete. But when were all the animals and the beasts made? And when was man made? Well, both were made on the sixth day. That's why we share the number six. It's the number of the beast and it's man's number two. But if seven is perfection and fullness, then man and beast fall short. Our number is six. Three sixes emphasises the fact that we always fall short. We keep falling short. Six, six, six. Never good enough. And that is why we need the blood of the Lamb, the Lord Jesus, only those who believe in him are safe. Everyone else, verse 8, will worship the beast. All whose names have not been written in the book of life belonging to the lamb that was slain. Without Jesus, all human beings automatically retain the number of man and beast. 666. The issue then is... Who do we belong to? Do we belong to God through faith in Jesus? 
Whose seal or mark do we have? Do we have the seal of the Holy Spirit living in us? Who will we trust and worship? Do we trust and worship King Jesus? It may well be temporarily more prosperous to worship the beast, to worship and trust human rule, but it is eternally disastrous. Yes, worshipping and trusting Jesus might make you poorer. In China, Christians can't complete their education. They are restricted to very low-paid jobs. The same is true in other countries. Here, it means doing business in a completely above-board way, which may not be as profitable. It means claiming benefits in a completely honest way, which may not be as profitable. Not conforming to every cultural norm. But don't be deceived by the beast and the one who is behind him, Satan. The thing I love about this chapter is that it tells us exactly what we should do in response to all this. Have a look at the end of verse 10. This calls for patient endurance and faithfulness on the part of the saints. And then verse 18. This calls for wisdom. So God has given us this strange chapter so that we may know our enemy. So that we may know his schemes and how he works still today. It is given so that we may be wise and discerning. And so that we may then patiently and faithfully endure. Keep on trusting and living for Jesus and not falling for the fake promises of Satan nor his fake leaders. We'll be tempted over and over again to go along with the world. But be wise. See who is behind worldly thinking and ideas and resist him. Resist him even as he does his worst against us. The beginning of verse 10 talks about believers being taken into captivity. That is happening all around the world. It also talks about the possibility of being killed on account of Jesus. That is also happening all around the world. It calls for patient endurance and faithfulness on our part to keep going with Jesus come what may. In Jesus we have the real eternal king and we are members of the supreme kingdom. So we must be wary of the fake kings or the fake kingdoms or the fake promises that Satan offers. Having shown a vision of frightening kingdoms rising from the earth, Daniel chapter, 17, Daniel chapter 7 verse 18 says this, But the saints of the Most High will receive the kingdom and possess it forever. Yes, forever and ever. You see, in the end, we who by God's grace endure and remain faithful win. We'll see more and more of that as we move on in Revelation. But while we wait for Jesus to return, we are called to endure, to be faithful and to be wise, which must mean discerning how Satan might be at work in our nation and society and culture and having the courage to stand out, even if it costs us dear. Will you pray with me now? Heavenly Father, your word today has called us to patient endurance and faithfulness. Patient endurance and faithfulness as human institutions and empires and world leaders set themselves up as supreme and forget you and persecute your people or exclude your people or make it hard for your people to live godly lives. Please help us to endure and to be faithful. Your word also calls us to wisdom. And so I pray you will help us to, to discern, particularly in our own culture, the subtle ways in which Satan is at work. Again, we pray for endurance and faithfulness to what is true and right in your eyes. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name and for your glory. Amen. Well, our final song today reminds us of the real king and that those who endure and keep trusting him will one day be with him let's stand to sing there is a higher throne